I'm very happy to be in Berlin. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I start to show one of my uh, favorite pieces of architecture in the history, that is the Eiffel Tower. Uh, here the early sketch uh, of a more taller building. And since I started uh, to do architecture, I have been always very interested in, in the potential of how collaborations can enrich uh, architectural solutions. In the case of the Eiffel Tower, it was a, a, a building that was supposed to be a temporary structure and became the symbol of the city. And for me, architecture is uh, also the opportunity to connect through innovation. So in the case of the Eiffel Tower, how you can actually bring the people on such a tall structure and was the opportunity then to solve uh, the principles that will develop then elevators and will change forever how we organize vertical cities. And I also love to see architecture in a connection with the technology of its time. If this is the way in which the cars, the trains and the industry look at the time when Eiffel was developing its tower, clearly very connected with the vision of how the structures of the industry would look like. If you see the image in orange, that almost resembles one of the legs of the Eiffel Tower. No? But for me also, architecture is very connected with a specific place. When you see the Eiffel Tower built in China, or even worse, when you see the Eiffel Tower built for a fashion show in the Grand Palais in Paris, with Chanel, uh, it almost became like a cartoon of, of the building because architecture at the end solves specific problems. And if the architecture doesn't solve those problems, it became simply scenography. No? And uh, when Michelle invited me and talked about modernity, I thought it was good for me to go back to uh, how I started to analyze architecture as a young architect, having always been interested in houses. Uh, here, of course, Villa Savoy by Le Corusier. And I met Michelle in, in Holland uh, in the OMA office that probably became one of the best schools of architecture in the world. Uh, where Rem Kulhas was working and collaborating with young architects from all around the world. And Rem has developed this book in the 90s that was small, medium, large, extra large, that became like a manifesto, uh, where all our generation was inspiring in the idea that architecture can be also a way to connect with other disciplines like art and literature. And Rem at the time has developed the house uh, that was uh, almost like a response to the Villa Savoy that was the house in Bordeaux, um, in which he basically uh, played with the idea of how the structure solve, not in generic columns, but more in the uh, in predictable solutions in a collaboration with Cecil Valman from Arup, and then tried to hang half of the volume with an elevated beam uh, and try to liberate the view to the Bordeaux Valley. And this is a view of my, uh, a picture of myself when I was a student. I was a student of architecture. I was the president of the society. And I invited Alvaro Cesar. My dream was to work with Alvaro Cesar in Portugal as a young architect. And this was probably similar to the age of most of the people in the auditorium. I was here maybe 24 years old. And uh, Cesar didn't give me any job. I ended up to collaborate only with him many years later, uh, 20 years later in a small project in Mexico. But for me, collaboration has been crucial and during the uh, early stage of my life as an architect, I have the privilege to work closely with Rem Kulhas, more recently with Tadando and with Foster. No? In the case with Kulhas, he asked me to design a house. And for me, the house was the opportunity to go beyond modernity in terms of not uh, replicating the principles of the generic structures uh, that build something like Bordeaux. So I proposed to him, when I designed this house, the white to gate house in Rotterdam, I proposed to him to have that void in the center that has um, a double uh, high space for the living space, and then arrange the rest of the program of the house, arrange the house. Um, this is the house of uh, Barragan in Mexico City. Uh, it's the Artigas uh, coloration, it's the Casa Prieto. And for me, this house was very important in the work of Luis Barragán, that was the most important Mexican architect of the last century, uh, because the architect was forced, in a way, to try to use traditional materials and try to go uh, with a connection with the past of our architecture in Mexico. In other words, the haciendas that has these high ceilings and these uh, wooden roofs. Or his own house, that is probably one of the most uh, well-known uh, works of Luis Barragán, 
uh, where he has also this kind of double high space in the center of the house, is the living area. So in a way, he was able to bring some of the principles of modernity in terms of cleaning the architecture and make it very purist, but at the same time try to keep some of the essence of high ceilings of uh, old buildings. So this is how the floor plan of the house was looking. So you have this kind of central void where you have the living space with it in area. And then you have uh, in both sides uh, the different areas for both the wife on the left and the husband on the right. Unfortunately, the client was not prepared for such a building. Uh, and we were invited for designing a concert hall in a competition and we basically blew up the scale of the project and we turned out to win the competition for the concert hall and build the project. A 120 million euros uh, project when I was 25 to have the privilege to design the building with Ryan was enough to decide then to come back to Mexico and start my own practice. <laughs> And this is the early models in which uh, we explain the concept to the client. So first we kind of carve the concert hall that was based on the shoebox, probably the best way to have the best acoustics for a concert hall. And then we arrange a number of uh, eccentric programs uh, around the form. And with that, we define the geometry of the building. Um, uh, it took six years. And during that time, I came back to Mexico and started my own practice. But the building was uh, the result of a great collaboration between Cecil Valmont, engineer from Arup, Rem Kulhas, and many great people with whom OMA used to work, like Petra Blasio, for example, uh, in terms of textiles and landscape designing. Uh, I came back to Mexico and I started again, uh, almost like uh, starting from zero, uh, as many architects do, by designing small projects. So I started to design houses. Um, and this is one of the early projects. Uh, it was commissioned by a client to do a very sustainable villa. So I proposed to him to have all the rooms floating in the second floor uh, in order to reduce the footprint uh, and then win more area around the house. The whole concept was that uh, the roof was the opportunity to have also a very sustainable villa in terms of having solar panels on the roof. Uh, and then uh, to have a double high living space here represented in yellow. Uh, that is the core of the project that was connected with all the second floor with all the rooms. No? The idea was to use the latest technologies with uh, American uh, collaborations with TT to try to have a house that was also working like a computer that can measure its own consumption. No? Um, and I show more recent projects in which I have been working. Uh, 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 Mexico is a very rich uh, country in terms of natural uh, 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 beauty. And in the Pacific of Mexico, I'm developing now two houses. The houses are uh, interesting from the point of view that they are uh, in, in plot 15 and 16, but they are opposites uh, in terms of their own identity. So one of the clients on the right hand wanted to have a very modern, simple, invisible villa. And in the left side, uh, the other client wanted to have something much more uh, iconic, cultural, and contemporary. So the first house is this one. So it's arranged in three stories. So you have, uh, you have basically, uh, uh, you have the parking here with a plaza of arrivals. Then you have the living space here without any columns. And then you go down and you have the rooms. Uh, the way in which we solve the structure is that this tilted wall basically carrying uh, all the slab to avoid to have columns here. And then you have here working as a birindel all the area for the rooms. Um, opposite to that, the other pavilion is uh, something that has a more organic uh, geometry. And we work with engineers and try to have a project in which uh, the structure works as uh, opportunity to connect all the programs in a more smooth way. Um, and also the opportunity that uh, the house became almost like a, like a shell uh, uh, or a shelter. No? With uh, TT engineers from New York, we developed the structure in such a way that it's uh, always based on continuous arches. So it's working always in compression and makes extremely efficient structure. This is the view from the eating space and then the view of the site. And uh, my practice is probably no uh, better by a uh, museum that we designed in Mexico. And I think over the last uh, maybe uh, three to four centuries, uh, there has been a shift of wealth between the public sector to the private sector in terms of 
how collections of art has been built more recently, uh, not longer public institutions by exceptions of maybe context like Middle East, but most of the countries now are building private collections and those uh, private individuals have the capacity to build their own museums, as this, for example, is the Arnaud Museum in Paris, designed by Frank Gehry that yesterday celebrated his birthday here in, uh, in Berlin uh, by coincidence. Um, and at the time that Arnaud was working with that museum, I was also working in a museum for Carlos Slim in Mexico, it was the same time where the Waltons were doing their museum in the United States, or uh, the Samsung family has over the last two decades developed their museums uh, in Seoul. Um, um, so basically this is uh, the museum I have designed. Uh, in the phase one, we develop uh, uh, one million square meters of construction. Uh, but over the last 10 years, more than uh, 3 million square meters of construction has been developing in the area. It used to be an industrial site, so it's a big transformation of all the area. And it has created uh, more than 3,000 apartment units, and the new American embassy is moving to this site. Uh, this is the beginning of construction of the project that we developed for the client, the museum here in the front. And here, the structure of the museum that we developed also in collaboration with Ove Arup, and for us was um, uh, the challenge of how to do a vertical museum, but also how to work with a client um, company that has been already building platforms uh, for all purposes on the scene. So um, we took uh, uh, the same principles. So we work the structure uh, by having uh, 28 columns, uh, each one with its own geometry and each one with its own uh, thickness plates. And those columns are then pre, uh, braced with all these uh, rings. And the diagonals help the structure for terms of uh, earthquake situations. Um, so here are the general principles. The idea is to have a vertical museum uh, that has exhibition in the four floors, a uh, super efficient vestibule that connects with the auditorium. Everything is connected by ramps through the facade. The collection was one of the most diverse collections in the country that includes uh, everything from jewelry to spoons to uh, sculptures up to paintings. Uh, and here the generic section where you try to uh, understand better the building. We have a concrete wall and this concrete wall receives the different uh, 28 columns. And we have 70 meters free of columns, uh, the last floor where we have all the sculptures of Rodin. And we hang the roof and, and in order to create a simple balance of the structure. Um, this huge cantilever is only possible in a place like Mexico where we have eight degrees uh, seismic uh, situations by only having a very heavy load of the roof that basically brings in all the columns. So this is how we build the project. So it's basically this concrete wall, 28 columns, the rings with the slabs connecting them and then the, the skin. Uh, I just repeat that animation because uh, I know that Chipperfield was here in the morning. And what was interesting was that opposite to that, the, the building that you'll see at the end on the, on the right here is uh, David uh, Chipperfield Humex Museum. Uh, I used to start to design Sumaya Museum in this side, and then I hear that Eugenio Lopez wanted to build his museum, so I convinced the client to sell this site to to Eugenio Lopez, and then uh, Eugenio Lopez hired Chipperfield to do a contemporary art museum. And it became almost accidentally, but uh, the museum that has the contemporary art became more classic solution. And the museum that has the traditional art collection became the more contemporary uh, building. Uh, so it, it was an accident, but uh, an accident that we uh, like it all. It became the, the two museums are the most important private collections. Um, the building has been visited for more than 10 million visitors, so it's the most visited private collection in the world. And we developed the facade with uh, Gary Technologies, uh, and we built uh, almost like a belt of 43 centimeter hexagons, and then we stretched the hexagons up to 120 centimeters, so it became almost like a dress uh, that represents a bit the diversity of the collection. Here, uh, uh, the representation of how more than 16,000 pieces of hexagons of more than 1,000 different sizes were created uh, shop drawings that were able to build the facade in less than a year. Um, 
the building became the most Instagram building. Uh, and probably this is uh, due to the fact that it's not longer this kind of generic box in the city, but it's um, a recognizable silhouette, recognizable skin. Uh, uh, so it became uh, a destination within the city that boosts also all the development in the area. No? Um, the whole purpose of the festival was to have this kind of flexible space. Uh, uh, in the beginning, it was free forever for uh, everybody. But then, when the client realized how attractive it was to do events in the lobby, then he started to rent the festival for events uh, three per week. And then that pays all the operation for the museum. This is the last floor where you have all the sculptures of Rodin with this kind of ring of compression at the top that brings all the columns inside on the facade. Here you see the, the cheaper field building. So uh, cheaper field building uh, uh, is all covering travertine. So uh, it's not only opposite in terms of uh, its complexity or form, uh, but also in terms of its materiality. No? Uh, here I was showing the building to Zaha Hadid, um, with whom I designed an old museum in Mexico that hasn't been built, but I uh, take the opportunity to show. Uh, is a museum that we designed for biodiversity. Mexico is among the fifth most uh, biodiverse countries in the world. So the idea of the project was to have different courtyards that enables the visitors to experience some of the diversity of climates that Mexico has. So passing through the jungle, the desert, and the different forests that we have in Mexico. No? And with this, I changed uh, to, to Burning Man. Burning Man is this festival uh, that happens every year in the United States, uh, in Arizona. And uh, the, last time, the last year I was able to, to visit the festival is singular from the point of view that they built a city uh, for only a week uh, in which you cannot use money. Everything is based on uh, trade of exchanging good uh, faith. Uh, people go there to enjoy music, but also to try to enjoy a uh, new way of living. Yeah, all, everybody here moves in bicycles or very sustainable transport. And in this specific moment, exists something that is almost like uh, the contrast of all the very intense life and party music uh, experiences. That is the temple. So uh, the temple we proposed for, for a competition was to do a temple based on a um, combination of different bubbles that creates um, a very efficient structure uh, composed by arches. Um, uh, and uh, the, um, one of the challenges of the project is you need to be able to build a structure uh, in only three days, but also that you are able to burn the structure at the end so that you don't leave any trace on the site. So I have this small video. That shows some of the principles of the competition. So it's a zoom to the, on the side, and billions of years ago on that side exists these uh, monocellular structures, and based on that monocellular structures, we have the inspiration for doing this temple. No? So this is a Burning Man uh, floor plan, uh, a circular floor plan uh, that has been based on hours and then on letters. So it's a very rational uh, system of uh, uh, urban organization. Everybody arrives here uh, to experience music for over a week, and then a week after, there's nothing on the site. So it's a vision of a temporary city that I have been always fascinated. And before I have the opportunity to actually be there, I designed a city in Central America called the Free City. Because Ecuador, a country of Central America, was very interested in developing a new uh, economical zone where they can invite foreign corporations by having a new uh, economical zone with a lot of incentives. So uh, uh, what I work over a year in the United States was the uh, master plan for a city of 3 million people. Uh, based on low-cost uh, transport, 
uh, in, all, in a way it's opposite to Mazdar that was developed by Foster in Middle East with high technologies. This is all low cost technologies. All the transport is on ground, uh, low density city, uh, um, uh, where we have a lot of attention to all the public space. No? Um, and that connects me to another city that I have designed between Mexico and the United States. It's also almost an utopia for the future, and it's called the Binational City. Uh, uh, so you see here on upper part is the United States, lower part is Mexico. So we have a client that has uh, the control of both sides. And actually before Trump administration arrived, we have been commissioned to develop this city. And it's based on the idea that uh, not only this is one of the most active borders in the world with more than 300 million crossings, where I have developed a book called Hyper Border that is the most relevant data between the two countries. But it's also a master plan based on the idea that uh, there's a lot of uh, immense opportunities in terms of business for uh, the Mexican side due to the fact that the labor is uh, much lower. So uh, the, the idea of the master plan was to create different thematical boroughs. So when it was the medical zone, so there's a lot of medical tourism, a lot of Americans that want to have lower cost of services in Mexican side. And of course, there's a, of course the industrial zone because Mexico maquila uh, produce a lot of the goods that are then consumed in the United States. Uh, but there's also the opposite uh, type of uh, tourism to where Mexicans go there uh, to have, for example, uh, um, all the goods they want to buy that they cannot buy in Mexico. So this being national city, of course, is an utopia that we think will happen uh, further in the future, where the borders are going to have completely different perception of what they are being discussed now with the idea of building the wall. And with this, I changed to Mexico City, uh, and I will talk with one of the projects I have spent the last 10 years, that is Mexico City Airport. Uh, this is a view of Mexico City, it's one of the fifth more uh, populated cities in the world. And uh, here, in this small animation, you will see how Mexico evolved from a little town over the last five centuries to one of the biggest metropolises in the world. Uh, Mexico City was based next to the lake of Texcoco, and over the last five centuries, that lake has dried, and on parallel, the city has just uh, got that immense growth. Especially from the 50s to the 80s, we grow and we change from 3 million to uh, 15 million. So the city changed in only 30 years, five times. Here you see how the city grows, especially 50 to the 80s, the fastest growth of any city in Latin America. Uh, uh, and I show here a couple of slides that are representative of that growth. Uh, and one of the moments of the city uh, with uh, maximum densities is Nezahuacoetl, uh, next to the old airport of Mexico City. And uh, I always hear that my family was related with um, planning uh, of uh, low boroughs, uh, low cost boroughs. Uh, uh, and then before this lecture, I just find so a couple of slides. So all this area in red where more than half a million people left. Uh, that was uh, looking uh, uh, like uh, people self-build their own houses, uh, similar to all the surroundings of Mexico City that looks like this. And this is the area where my family actually worked, uh, my grandfather and my father, for more than 30 years. Here, my grandfather, uh, uh, Raul Romero Cenizo, uh, who has been working uh, in that borough. No? And who will say that then, uh, half a century later, I was going to be involved in Mexico City Airport. Uh, so here you see in this slide, this is the current airport that receives 43 million passengers per year. Uh, we have two terminals and two runways of three kilometers, uh, an old dated infrastructure. And then the new master plan that was the result of more than 30 years of analysis developed with Mitre, American firm based in Washington. Uh, the new master plan enabled us to have up to six runways. Uh, uh, they can operate simultaneously up to three uh, for up to 120 million passengers per year. In the phase one, uh, we were uh, building uh, runway uh, two, runway three, and the terminal that will enable the country to receive up to 77 million passengers. So this is the biggest project uh, of infrastructure that Mexico has overtaken. Uh, it is the biggest airport on construction in the Americas. Uh, and here the different phases, so it will include the uh, air, uh, services for the city or call airport cities, uh, the different terminals uh, in the different phases, 
and you can build up to six runways in the different uh, moments of the project, and of course all the cargo and service of the airport. Uh, I was invited to the competition as well as other eight Mexican architects. I was the youngest architect involved uh, or invited, and uh, each of the architects needed to find a partner, and I was introduced to Norman Forster. So we do the partnership and we won the project. Um, and we think we won the project because we tried to analyze some of the history of Mexico, but also some of the symbols. And this is a floor plan. We arranged the gates in the form of the X that is so representative for Mexico. Uh, um, so the diagram of the competition, let's try to take some of the symbols and let's try to do something that connects with our history. Here's some of the meetings with Norman where we were uh, confrontated all his team that were saying that it was impossible to do a single building and we convinced uh, all the airport planners that was able to be developed as a single building. And here's some of the moments of our previous history uh, momentum. So this is uh, Teotihuacan, uh, the pyramid of the sun. This is a colonial uh, architecture in downtown Mexico City built by the Spanish people. And then this is Modernity Ramirez Vasquez Anthropology Museum in Mexico. And rather of doing a generic uh, type of almost shopping mall airport, as most of the solutions in America have been done in the last uh, 30 years, what we proposed was let's rather do a singular structure that enable us to have big spans uh, and maximum flexibility due to the fact that the airport is always connected with how the technology of aviation evolves. So this is how the central space looks. So you have 180 meters free of columns. It's the area where you have all the retail. Uh, that means that after you pass security, you run control this space, and then you go to reach your gate that are arranged in the form of X. And we work with Oveado from New York, and all the structure has been uh, Develop similarly of how Gaudi developed his own uh, calculations for its buildings, uh, meaning um, with gravitational loads, you are able to have the most efficient curves for, for the structure. Uh, and this small animation uh, showed the final uh, model after gravitational loads were applied to the structure. Here you have security, and then uh, you go down and you have that central space before you reach, reach your gates. And for us, it was a, a way to show also what Mexico was able to do in terms of engineering and what was able to do as the gate uh, to the country. No? Uh, it was interesting for us to try to design all the furniture in relationship to the section of the building. So this is a ticketing uh, booth where the luggage will go down that integrates all the air conditioning and that in a way has a huge relationship with the section of the overall structure. No? And the best way to understand an airport probably is through levels. Uh, it's easy, the most complex piece of infrastructure that an architect can build. Uh, and basically, you have platform level where you have all the infrastructure that uh, enables the planes to work, but also is where you move all the luggage. Then you have uh, 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 arrivals that connects to the core of the project where you have immigration, and then you have departures. Those are like the principal levels. No? And then you can analyze the floor plan. So it's a 1.6 kilometer long building that has been broken in two in order to have uh, shorter connections by buses. Uh, after one year of analysis, we decided to have um, uh, separated uh, uh, a luggage system in order to reduce connections uh, between planes. Uh, then you have uh, the level of ar uh, arrivals. So you have these long corridors that connect with the core of the project where you have immigration. Immigration of the latest generation that enables you to separate the floats between uh, people that arrive to the city and people that have connecting flights. Uh, then you have the level of departures where you have all the shopping area and then uh, the different gates uh, with services and, uh, of course, with travelators to reduce distances and times of connection. And uh, finally, you have uh, a small part of the building that has all the arrival hall, where you have all the ticketing areas, uh, security filters, uh, shopping mall, and offices for the airlines. Uh, since we are in a technical school, I thought this was relevant. So this is a competition where we work one year to define the concept. 
Uh, three years later, after 500 architects and engineers were working between London, Mexico, and New York, uh, this is how the building looks. Uh, so it's similar in terms of the principles, but very different in terms of the detail. Um, we designed, for example, that the uh, way to celebrate the gates was also an opportunity to do those uh, compressions and was a way to build more stable structure. Um, and from this, uh, we were able to build a model three, BIM 300 uh, that enabled us to define more than 10,000 drawings that enabled the drawing and the client to actually bid the project and choose the contractor. No? So it's the most complex project that Mexico has defined uh, and ever built. No? So for us, it was an opportunity to also show what uh, you can do for having a building that is extremely efficient with natural resources. So the perforation in the building uh, is enough to bring as much natural light and avoid as much as possible electric uh, consumption. Um, because as we mentioned before, Mexico used to be next to the lake of Texcoco. Since the competition, we knew that this was a very challenging site for the foundations. Uh, uh, so we work with the best uh, engineers in the world, so it's the best geotechnical engineer from Arup and the best local engineer. They both met uh, uh, 50 years ago when they were studying in American universities, and they both come with this proposal in which uh, we take the principle of compensation. So on the left you see how the stone just sinks in the water. On the right, you see the stone uh, with more surface of contact, how it creates a balance and enables uh, the same stone to float. With that same principle, uh, we define our foundation. So we have a, uh, it's the same principle that enables a ship in the ocean to float, actually. Uh, and uh, so it's a mega slab of concrete that enables the building to float on site. Um, what this means is basically that the same amount of uh, weight that we get out of, of the site, we bring back with a mega slab of concrete of 1.6 kilometer long. Uh, uh, so in our words, when you combine the slab plus the weight of the uh, different levels plus the weight of the roof, that total weight equals the weight of the land that we are getting out of the site. So the underground doesn't feel any difference of weight. And this enables us to have the same uh, movement uh, uh, and then move in harmony with the capacity of compression of the site with the runways, right? The building has been designed as mega blocks. Uh, uh, so you have uh, um, seismic joints between all these change of colors. So it's like almost um, building mega blocks. Here in relationship to Manhattan, just to have a sense of the scale of the building. And then here, a small animation of how uh, we develop uh, uh, the structure uh, and how we thought how the structure must be built. So again, this idea of mega blocks. And here they are showing, uh, basically in this animation, the ideal uh, construction process of how you build those mega blocks. And on parallel of the slabs, you start to build the roof. In the competition, we proposed to build a lead platinum airport. And the best way to achieve that was through how we solve the facade. So the facade has uh, uh, contact in all the perimeter of the building and also in those 21 mega columns. It's precisely the mega columns that enable us to have this uh, superficial agenda because they were the opportunity to bring all the water and reuse it in the services, but also to actually make the building breathe from the far south, because we are bringing the fresh air through those tunnels, and then we inject it through the slabs. Uh, um, and we try also to do the same with the light. We are bringing all the natural light from those moments. Huh? Uh, part of the competition was also to design the control tower. Uh, the control tower is basically the opposite in terms of uh, structural performance because uh, the terminal is very horizontal, so it reacts very different to seismic. The tower uh, 
is able to build up to one meter where you have seismic movements uh, because we have 12 uh, seismic isolations. Uh, uh, and of course, the earthquake uh, hits uh, much traumatic to vertical structure. No? Here's uh, some pictures of the site. And a small video of, of the situation. There you see the different seismic isolations for the tower. And that the mega slab of concrete that enables the building to flotate uh, with the principle of compensation. No? <coughs> and the beginning of how they were putting the structure together of the slabs and then of the funnels. No? They asked me what you want to design. Like maybe eight years ago, and say my dream would be to design an airport. And I thought maybe one day when I was 80, in a different city in the world, a small airport, and by accident I was able to uh, have the opportunity to design uh, the biggest airport in America, in my own city. Uh, but dramatically, uh, we just have a new president, and the president uh, decided to put on hold the site two months ago. So I think this is partly uh, maybe like a crisis of democracy. And the fact that somebody put on hold a project that was fully financed, that was going to pre become the gate to Mexico. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, I also want to share with you that uh, uh, I found this beautiful coincidence. Uh, this is the site. And uh, 25 kilometers far away, you have Teotihuacan, as I just previously mentioned. This is Teotihuacan, Calza de los Muertos, Pyramid of the Moon and Pyramid of the Sun. At the time, in, this year, in the century fifth, the most important prominent structure in the continent. And here you see the overlap of uh, Teotihuacan with the terminal of the airport. So we find an uh, incredible coincidence because Calza de los Muertos is basically the same length of the building. And then uh, the Pyramid of the Sun fit precisely inside our building. So uh, that was simply a coincidence, a big surprise that uh, that, um, that became almost like the inspiration of the building uh, becomes now uh, also something so literally connected and so pricely connected that half uh, the most prominent structure in the fifth century in the continent nearby and then being able to have that um, almost uh, scale comparison. Um, and we think we won the project because we didn't want it to copy other airports in the world, like many other participants, but we rather thought that was a great opportunity to design the gate of Mexico. And Mexico uh, changed from being the 12th most visited country to more recently being up to the seventh most visited country in the world, uh, one of the richest countries in terms of natural resources, but also one of the richest in terms of our own more than 20 centuries of culture. No? Uh, and of course, infrastructure is for us uh, an investment to the future. So when you build infrastructure, you are building for the kids and the generations to come. Uh, the project was going to create a lot of employment and social and economical development for the country. Uh, again, we think that uh, uh, moments like Mo uh, Anthropology Museum uh, done in the 70s was a great way to show our richness. Uh, here you see the history of all our different cultures. So you see here the Mayas, the, the Incas, and all the different Prespanic cultures we have in the country. Uh, here, of course, just a little bit of the words that I'm sure you know. This is Chichen Itza, done by Mayas, astrological site in the south of Mexico. Uh, the richness of our food and the richness of our natural resources here in the Sea of Cortez. And as I just mentioned before, so the, the uh, recent uh, president just decided to put a 1% uh, population that support him on vote. And with that, he appeared with, before he actually became president and said, I will stop the project, and he stopped the project. Cost to Mexico more than $30 billion on losses, just the announcement. Uh, and of course, uh, it's a promise that he has in the campaign similar to the promise that Trump has done when he promised to do the wall between Mexico and the United States, that everybody knows that it's useless because the drugs and the immigration will remain to happen. No? And with this, I show the last project is Hyperloop. Uh, Hyperloop is uh, also uh, technology that is connected highly with how to move people in the world, but also 
of how to create development uh, through infrastructure. And this was an early representation in the 70s of how people uh, imagine how people will move in the future. Uh, so Elon Musk suggests in a paper, only in theory for academics, that the future will be indeed to move people I inside a tube. Uh, and then the company was created called Hyperloop in the United States in San Francisco. And this company has uh, developed this technology in which uh, you can have the most efficient way of transport for the future because it's uh, moving trains with magnetic energy that is the most efficient and uh, because it's inside the tube you reduce the friction uh, with the air so with less energy you can achieve faster speed so the problem is not the speed you can go up to 1000 uh, 1500 kilometers per hour uh, the challenge is, is only the technology and the software that has been developed for that purpose no? Here you see the magnetic uh, elements that are through uh, the line, and then how the, um, the train moves up. The, so Hyperloop has developed all the prototypes in the desert in Arizona. Uh, here you see how the building actually, uh, the train actually levitates, so uh, reduce friction, and how the air is sucked out of the tube, so uh, it becomes easier uh, for the mass to move without friction to the air. No? This is a prototype that they develop in the desert. Uh, uh, they start to build the first one in Dubai that connects Dubai to Abu Dhabi. And the countries that has the further development is Finland and Holland. And, um, and they have launched a competition uh, to see where this technology is better to fit. And we won the competition among 2,600 participants. They choose the best 10 corridors in the world. And it appears that the center of Mexico was one of the best corridors in the planet to apply the technology. Here, comparison of the, the amount of energy uh, and the amount of speed that you can reach. So you see the, the uh, time that you take um, to take the same distance in, in, a, in a bus, 11 hours, and how you can reach the same uh, distance in you know, less than 43 uh, minutes in this train. Again, this competition, uh, and these are the selected best corridors in the world. We were very proud to be selected to connect the center of Mexico. You see other places in the world, like uh, India, and the different places that in the United States are applying the technology. You know? What we proposed was to connect uh, uh, what is called the Bajio, that is the area that has received the biggest foreign investment, is the area where we have all the industrial corridor uh, that after the NAFTA, the agreement with the United States was developed. So here we have uh, Mexico City, Querétaro, León, and Guadalajara. Those four cities have uh, an important industrial uh, presence. Uh, it's a distance of five, 500 kilometers, so it's the optimum distance for the technology. Uh, we work with the government and with that company to find the best route. Uh, uh, and basically here you show a representation of that technology. You know? Uh, and in the future, of course, we think that the technology should be uh, extended so that it connects both ports, the ports of the Gulf of Mexico with the Gulf of the Pacific, and then, of course, to the border uh, to be able to connect goods to the United States, with whom we have a $600 billion market. We export uh, to the United States more than $300 billion, and we import from the United States more than $300 billion again. Uh, with this image, I want to finish. Uh, I, after being working in the airport, I am uh, very interested in the development of infrastructure, uh, not only in Mexico, but in Latin America. We think there is a huge way in which you can use technology uh, to build projects that are going to help the people, not only to build it uh, in the construction process to help a lot of employment, but also on how this can become a tool to develop uh, cities and then to develop uh, context. No? In the case of Hyperloop, it's a great opportunity to develop new centers of cities uh, and, of course, reduce uh, times of connection and reduce pollution between those connections. No? Uh, we know that this technology will take a lot of time to develop in countries such as Mexico. We think that 
first richest countries are going to apply the technology in the next 10 years. Countries like Mexico are going to probably use this technology in the next 15 to 20 years, but we still think it's crucial for how Mexico will be connected with the economy of uh, America and, the, and our rest of the countries connected. No? Um, with this, I want to finish. Thank you again for this invitation. It was an honor to be here with you. Thank you.